the meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from our colleague Alex Rowley. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items 6, 7, 8 and 9 in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Thank you. The second item on the agenda is for the committee to uh, to welcome Alex Neil uh, and to ask him to declare any relevant interest. Mr. Neil, uh, nothing beyond the register of interest, convener. Thank you. The item three on the agenda is uh, to take evidence on the environmental governance report of the Roundtable on Environment and Climate Change. Can I welcome Professor Campbell Gemmel, Lloyd Austin, Johnny Hughes, and by video link Professor Colin. Read, uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, we will move straight to questions. Uh, John Scott. Um, thank you very much, convener. Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for coming to give us the benefit of your evidence today. Um, I want to firstly ask about the role of the EU institutions in relation to environmental law. And might I ask you uh, what specific functions do the EU institutions provide for member states in relation? to environmental law. Uh, convener and uh, Mr Scott, the, the answer is probably starting with the fact that that's a very big question, <laughs> which has taken us um, 40 years or so to develop. Um, it starts, I suppose, at a fairly uh, simple level of inter-member state uh, and inter-member state subordinate agency dialogue. And therefore, the exchange of information um, is a fairly fundamental part of, of uh, the structures. And it spans across a spectrum all the way to the ultimate powers of the, of the European Court of, of Justice or the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, and so we have components that come from uh, the uh, institutions that involve uh, reporting requirements in terms of uh, uh, environmental monitoring data. Uh, these are shared, for example, with the European Environment Agency, they're shared with the European Commission, uh, and they're shared actually through a whole number of other structures with bodies that connect into uh, the institutions of the European Union. Um, we have reporting obligations specifically in terms of uh, compliance with directives. Um, we have elements that connect also with international agreements but have European uh, institutional components and we have the uh, approach taken and the, and pow the powers that are held by the Commission to require clarification on member state performance uh, and on institutional performance against the directives and other components of legislation within uh, the European system um, and that leads to uh, what I would call soft pursuit in terms of being asked to explain what is going on within a member state um, uh, through to the more formal processes that re result through uh, the structures and the powers of the of the union actually to require uh, a recourse and process to be taken to the, to the court. Um, so it's a very wide uh, span of, of different components if, if I uh, I hope I've responded to the question in that general sense. Uh, colleagues, particularly uh, Colin, uh, I suspect, uh, are able to clarify further. But it, I, I think it's very important to recognise the breadth of those institutional connections and, and consequences. Professor Reid, do you want to add to that? I think just the one thing I would add is that in a lot of recent work, there's been an emphasis on the reporting, monitoring, enforcement stage. We've got to remember that the EU institutions are also important at the stage of creating the law, setting standards, providing guidance as well, and being cut off from those processes will be a change on the way environmental matters are, are looked at as well. Okay, thank you. John Scott. Um, Lloyd, Austin, do you want to add to that? I agree completely with what Campbell and Colin have said, but um, just to to illustrate the way in which the report from the subgroup has tried to address these matters. In, in 2.3, we, we list five categories of activity and functions that the European Union institutions, sorry, 2.4, paragraph 2.4, uh, 
um, implementation of law and policy, monitoring, measuring, reporting, checking compliance, enforcing, and institutional cooperation. Those are the five categories that we, we felt as we were producing a report summarized those range of functions and the range of things that the different institutions do. Thanks very much. I suppose, um, perhaps more importantly, well, well, these things are really a matter of, of um, record as, as they stand. We're really more interested in what are the likely gaps in oversight and governance of environmental law after Brexit as you envisage it. Um, again, we, we've tried to do that in a, in a structured manner within the, re the report by looking at um, different environmental media and, and, and sort of sub uh, subjects that don't don't fit into that neat air water uh, land uh, classification. So we, we've looked at this across everything, including uh, chemicals, uh, nature conservation, etc. Um, and we f first of all effectively um, assessed what the current arrangements were. Uh, and then moved into trying to identify um, the gaps that, that could emerge. Uh, and ultimately, the, the report then looks at the sort of um, potential uh, uh, ways uh, of addressing those gaps. Um, the, the gaps, I suppose, again, we've detailed the, the, the different uh, categories, and they span from the informal, the soft, the sharing of technical expertise, the, the failure potentially to participate or be invited to participate in, in knowledge exchange groups. Uh, we could lose uh, in terms of not being able to access technical professional information. For example, in my former core field, uh, the individual member states benefit hugely from the uh, scientific underpinning and technical and engineering underpinning work that's done by centres of expertise across the, the European Union, uh, to which we have access for best available technology, best available techniques, for example. Uh, similar arrangements exist in, in each of the thematic areas, effectively, that we, we've looked at, including, for example, REACH, uh, where chemical information cannot readily be duplicated uh, in every single jurisdiction or subordinate component of a jurisdiction. It would be uh, uh, horrendously expensive potentially to do that. Um, but there are also gaps in terms of uh, the citizens' rights uh, of access to information potentially and the powers that, that um, citizens have to request information and actually to, to uh, initiate a process that ultimately would result in uh, informal uh, court proceedings or could result in formal co court proceedings. So we, we've tried to detail the different categories of gap and I, I suspect it, it's probably more efficient to, um, uh, in due course, perhaps try to digest the, the range of what we've got in here. It's a, it's a pretty large potential set of gaps. But I would stress that at this point one of our challenges is simply knowing uh, what the end of the story might be, because frankly, uh, the, the, a lot of this would be subject to, to future agreement between Scotland and the UK, as well as between the UK and the, and the European Union. It's not entirely clear. So identification of gaps, I suppose we've identified the risk of gaps rather than any certain knowledge of what gaps would, would emerge. Again, my, my colleagues might want to uh, pick up on more detail there. Okay. Um, yes, that, thank you for your question. I th it, it, it actually sparked um, uh, an idea in my mind in, in that we, we, we covered in, in the report mainly, as, as, as Lloyd Austin said, the monitoring, measuring, reporting, the checking compliance, the enforcement and the institutional cooperation side of things. But what we didn't, didn't look at was the, the actual beginning of that process, so the policy development. And, and that, I think, is, is another major gap in, in terms of Scotland's influence on that policy development our contribution to it through through both the UK and directly would, would, would again be lost. Now, you, you could say that's a governance gap or you could say that's a kind of policy cooperation um, and development gap, but nevertheless very important because, as, as, as you may know, um, around about 80% of environmental legislation in Scotland um, is purported to have derived from EU legislation. So um, I, I think it's an important point to raise that there would be a gap both in policy development and in the, the, the other issues that re the report um, seeks to uh, uh, explore solutions on. Thank you. Um, I mean, we'll come to more detailed questions in that regard uh, later on in the series of questions. Um, Thank you, Convener. Stuart Stevenson. Um, 
I just wanted to pick up on what uh, Professor Gemmo has just said, and in relation to, and it was quite a long list of references, but the first one was knowledge exchange groups, the next one was academic access to information. Just to help us understand, do either of those or any of the other things in the list involve non-EU actors? Um, yes, <laughs> several of them um, do. At the moment, for example, the European Environment Agency involves non-EU states. Uh, there are a number of other arrangements that um, connect very strongly between international treaty obligations and, and EU law, where non-EU non member states are participants. Um, there are issues where there are different um, uh, voting rights, as it were, different powers, different um, uh, uh, abilities to access information between those those categories of membership. But, uh, for example, uh, the other EEA uh, countries, Norway, for example, has access to uh, a lot of the uh, data that are provided on, on technologies for environment control, for example. Can I, can I just pick that up? Because I think it's very important that we understand what the boundaries are, because we are going to be the other side of the boundary. So, can you identify anything that Norway does not get access to as a non-EU state that would be material and of interest to us in Scotland? Yes. Um, again, I suspect colleagues could um, provide me, provide you with, with some additional detail. Uh, for example, during the Water Framework Directive processes, looking at intercalibration and the way in which data were, uh, were shared and uh, design was considered by the groupings of the way in which a directive could be operationalised at member state mem uh, level. Uh, countries that were outside the EU were able to access the results of the consideration but not actually to participate in the discussions uh, around the detail and its formulation. So uh, I mean, that would just be an example where there's a, there's a, a matter of degree. Um, but in terms of, of a more absolute difference, um, I'm not sure I have an example to hand, but perhaps colleagues would. Um, I on that? I think we've got a problem with the sound. <laughs> no, sorry, I, I was, I've been trying to think of concrete examples as well. The, there have been studies of this, of all the various European collaboration bodies, and each of them is different in terms of its constitution, the status of EU members, non-EU members, the, the levels of cooperation. So there's no overall, there's no overall all-encompassing answer would be a question of looking in each individual case at particular the, the particular formulation and the way of working of the different bodies. Lloyd Austin, do you want to come in? Um, I think Collins said it, but I was going to say it really do, does depend on the terms of reference and the constitution of the individual um, institution and cooperation arrangement that we're talking about. I mean, the one thing I would say is that the non-EU uh, member states do engage much more in this sort of informal uh, data exchange end of the governance arrangements. They're not so much involved in the compliance and enforcement end, which does uh, rely on um, European law and directives, etc., which only apply to full member states. Okay. Well, we'll come to the issue of enforcement, I think, in another part of our questioning. But in the initial remarks from Professor Gemmel, you painted a hierarchy from exchange of information, if you like, at the softest end, uh, to legal oversight and action at the, the, the most robust end. I think the, throughout our questioning, the thing that will be of interest to us here is what we actually lose when we cross the boundary and what options we have to re-opt in to issues once we're out of the boundary. And I think, I think you know, that's it, uh, as far as the Scottish Government, I imagine, but certainly as far as this committee is concerned. So are there particular uh, options for the UK, for that matter, not just Scotland, um, to participate in European expert bodies that, that we might want to focus on robustly to make sure we're not excluded from post-Brexit? You know, that's really cuts to the the heart of this. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, I, I, I would also stress, though, that because we're not at the end of this process, we don't have clarity about what is negotiable in this particular space. And, for example, my, my current um, priority is looking at the management of radioactive waste across uh, the, the, uh, the 
the UK, and uh, how we deal with that. And it's interesting to note that the Prime Minister has already indicated that she's seeking some sort of associate membership of, of Euratom, which doesn't actually exist at the moment. You're either a member or you're not a member. Um, and we've looked at the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Authority, and looked at its powers and, and, and the, the, its mores in terms of sharing information, etc. Um, it has a broad span, the latter, um, but it doesn't actually have the powers of intervention and holding to account, uh, for example, that we have uh, within, within Euratom. Um, so it might be that we are allowed to have associate status and that, that might mean that we have access to information and it might mean we are able to seek uh, assurance about the proper management of wastes in the UK and in Scotland. But it might not. Uh, and that's just one example of, of where being in and being out have very distinct uh, di differences and, and benefits and disbenefits, but we don't yet know where we stand. Can I, I'm, I'm going to make a remark and then hand back to the community for the next... Uh, section and, and the remark I would suggest is that uh, we can contribute here uh, not simply responding to what is happening or not happening or might happen or might not happen but to inform because I think I think there's a the, there's a bit of a lacuna a bit of a vacuum in that informing of what the real coal face options are and I think colleagues will develop that I think Lloyd Austin wanted to make a point. Well, I was going to uh, make a comment like Mr Stevenson's, really, that we could inform the discussion about the arrangements that go forward. Um, I, uh, um, Campbell's right about the, the radioactive and the Eurotom agency, but the Prime Minister's also referred to the European Chemicals Agency, uh, not to the EEA, the European Environment Agency, but I think that would be one that would be worth... Uh, us encouraging uh, the UK to continue to engage in. Um, it, it may not be it, the, 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 whether or not there's any possibility of Scotland engaging and the UK not is another matter, but uh, I think uh, the more we can encourage the UK to think of ways of being engaged in these information exchange uh, and uh, cooperation bodies, the better. Again. Thank you, Kevin. Just a, a short PS. I, I think it's important to note that we're already experiencing the, the potential disadvantages of, of being outside the ring. Horizon 2020 projects and the way in which uh, academic institutions are being disinvited or not invited into a particular dialogue. But also we're seeing plans being made for things like the, the Seville Group, which looks at best available te technologies not inviting the UK in any shape or form to the discussion. Now, these things shape future industrial management policy in, in terms of allowing companies to make engineering investment decisions. If we don't know what's happening, that brings a significant potential disadvantage. And again, that's just one area. Uh, Claudia Beamish. If I'm Kavina, good morning to you all. Could I just push um, the panel a little further to explain the value of the European Environment Agency and uh, if there would be any barriers to joining? And indeed, um, I mean, Lloyd Austin's already touched on it and I think you have as well, um, Professor Gemmell, but it would be helpful to know that. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I suspect colleagues can, again, uh, add a lot of detail here. I, I, I've worked closely with the EA since 2001 um, and it has a quite a complex governance um, structure of members and alternate members, which attempts to bring in all member states and often seeks emphasis for uh, devolved administration areas for particular subjects and is very, has been very open to inviting uh, expertise to participate. Um, it was designed initially, although it was modified when it went through the European Parliament, as actually a body that would ultimately hold members to account. But it has substantially played a role, uh, as confirmed, <coughs> excuse me, um, as a data manager and data interpreter, effectively, for the European Union. A role that it's performed, I think, generally um, ex extremely well, if I make that, that comment. Um, there is um, the governance model would allow additional members, but I think it has taken quite a pragmatic view that there are only so many times you can have 54 people in a room uh, and make you know, simple, rational, quick decisions about anything. Um, but it, I think it would be entirely feasible to consider uh, a, an associate membership, but I don't think it would allow a robust access to the kind of information and to the process influence that the EEA has in terms of advising the Commission about good and bad practice, good and bad performance. Thank you. 
Okay. It's the EA is very much that that EEA. There's two <laughs> uh, EEAs, uh, but the Environment Agency is very much a, a, a data collection, collation, analysis, and publication uh, a body uh, and an advisor. So it's very uh, focused on the technical support side of things. Uh, it does have associate members at the moment who are non-EU members, so Norway and Switzerland and some of the eastern countries are, uh, Balkan countries and so on, are associate members. Um, uh, I think uh, engagement with it, UK mem associate membership of it, if Brexit happens, would be, uh, in my view, desirable. And I, I would think that any any support that could be given to that proposal uh, would be a positive. Johnny Hughes. Yeah, but just two things to add. We do cover this in section 4.2.13 in our report. And really, we in the report, we try to provide a situation analysis and we stop short of, of, of actually recommending um, anything, really. But um, I, I noticed that in that paragraph, we actually do say that um, membership of the EEA should be actively pursued. So we broke our, we, we broke our remit slightly there. Um, so I think that gives you a very clear um, um, steer from certainly what the um, what, what the round table thought. I would just add one thing to to what's already been said, and that's the that's the benchmarking function of, of, of the EEA in, in terms of gathering data from across the union, and then um, and then uh, putting in reports. You know, who, which 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 are the the laggards and, wh and which are the front runners, and I think that's ex an extremely useful way of um, trying to bring up some of those member states which are, which are not implementing the various EU environmental directives. Um, um, and, 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 and that would, I think, some, that would be something that would be missed if we weren't members of the EEA in future. Colin Reid. I was just going to say that some of this is covered in a substantial paper that the UK Environmental Law Association published at the beginning of the year. That's one of our references. It lists all the various in European bodies with an environmental connection. and talks a bit about what they do, what their constitution is, how far they are accessible, available to non-members. So there's a lot more detail in, in that paper. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's move this along and look at what future scrutiny might look like in terms of implementing environmental legislation post-Brexit. Um, can I ask you to, to comment on two aspects of this? One would be what role you would see for the Scottish Parliament in that regard and its committee system. But the, also would, the other point would be about this um, new Office of Environmental Scrutiny and Audit that has been suggested by yourselves. Uh, can you talk us through why, uh, what it might look like and how quickly you think it could be set up? In uh, section 4.3 and, and thereafter, we, we've gone into that in, in uh, a certain amount of detail. But I, I think we, we also say quite explicitly that we, we, d we didn't go too far. We didn't want to go too far because working out the aspirations that Scotland might have in this context is clearly an important and potentially iterative and, and participatory process. Um, but the, w clearly the Scottish Parliament um, sits currently at the, at the sort of peak, at the, at the ceiling of oversight, as, we, as we've called it, uh, for implementation and performance by the government of the day and by, by uh, agencies, etc. Um, and, and that's a perfectly satisfactory model that has worked uh, very well. And I think we, we've also tried to stress that the process is at the top end, as it were, of the Commission and, and onward to, to the CGEU are, are to be used in extremists. They're not, they're not in everyday use. And the number of cases has actually uh, reduced somewhat. The numbers are slightly tr tricky to get, and we gave a 2016 number in the, in the report about the, the sort of infractions that progress towards that stage. But in a sense, we were highlighting uh, their threat value, um, pour encourager les autres, etc. I mean, it's, it's been very much about attempting to ensure that everyone is aware that were we not to do the right thing, there would be consequences. Um, now, a parliamentary committee such as, as your own clearly has, has significant potential to highlight and, frankly, to embarrass uh, those who maybe have something about which they should be embarrassed. So that, there is an opportunity there to front that kind of information uh, up at that, in that way. But in extremists, failures to comply with, with the law 
ultimately can end up with, with those robust legal sanctions. So we're, we're not in any way questioning this, the Scottish Parliament's value. It's clearly a very fundamental part of the, of the existing governance and, and uh, pursuit model, if I call it that. Um, I think what we were suggesting was that there being no um, higher body we would have reporting responsibilities, scrutiny and oversight responsibilities, issues of um, clarification that resulted in very clear evidence of failure. And what is the top of that? There are no further consequences than you know, being hauled before uh, the Scottish Parliament. Um, do we want there to be a higher power? Now, for some international agreements, there are already international bodies. Um, frequently, they have far fewer teeth and are even less likely to use them uh, than the institutions of the EU. So uh, an office... Um, Sorry, I, I should add, we did look at existing bodies like Audit Scotland that clearly have the power to bring things forward uh, in, a, in a pretty uh, robust way from an independent stance. If we do not have other bodies, there is a very serious danger, which we, we highlighted, of people marking their own homework. That, that there may be a tendency to, to give a good gloss. Now, as an ex-regulator myself, I'm, I'm slightly leery of going too far with that because I think most people come to work in the morning hoping and intending to do a very good objective job based on their duties. They are professionals and should be treated as such. But there are always risks. and. Um, who guards the guards is something that always needs to be borne in mind. So I, I do not have a problem, uh, we do not have a problem um, with articulating there being uh, 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 a higher level of, of scrutiny and potential pursuit. So this office that we've identified could be a variation on existing mechanisms. It could be the allocation of additional powers and responsibilities and resources to, to uh, an existing organisation potentially like Audit Scotland. It could be a parliamentary committee of some kind that is a capo di tutti capi that effectively has the power to operate above the parliament but within the parliament. Um, or it could be an entirely new uh, independent body. Um, I think it's about credibility and p the public believing that its servants are properly being held to account for performance as expected. Um, so I, I think it requires further work to fatten that out, to make it meaningful, to cost it, etc. Uh, we we pr very, very lightly looked at international um, practice. Uh, there is much more that could be done there. We had very limited time in which to, to pursue this. But there are, there are broadly comparable bodies worldwide, including court models, but others that could be uh, tailored to our needs. But I think that requires a much um, wider and, more, and deeper conversation than we've currently had. But colleagues, it, again, it, could... Just follow up on that. I know Lloyd also wants to come in. I mean, I think it'd be fair to say in Scotland we have environmental stakeholders who are not slow to voice their opinions. So, And that's a good thing. Um, but they would undoubtedly want any such body to be credible and sufficiently expert um, so have you kind of fleshed it out a little bit more in that direction? Perhaps Lloyd or Johnny Hughes are the best people to come back I on Just that. coming up, we, we do cover that in the report, and what's one of the reasons, I think, well, there's two, two other options to this, and one, one is that, you know, the collective of NGOs, if you like, could try and, try and hold the government to account. I think there's, there's, there's all sorts of issues with that. One, one is that, in, in some ways, it's the marking your own homework question. You know, we, we'd be... Um, potentially seen as having a, a conflict of interest and maybe going too far and not having that independence. Similarly, if you give it to a, an existing body like Audit Scotland, there's, there's, a, there's an expertise gap um, and a perception, even if you did bring in the expertise into Audit Scotland, that you know, Audit Scotland is a much broader body looking rather narrowly through the financial lens. Um, so we really did come to the conclusion, although maybe it's not clear in the report, because as I say, we, we, we tried to really present it as a situation analysis, but we did come to the conclusion in the report that really an independent um, scrutiny and uh, an enforcement body is, is required. And you asked the question why we need this, and it's because one of the very, very clear things that we will be losing as we exit the European Union is the, the oversight scrutiny role of the European Commission and uh, the, the, the power of the Commission to then um, relay any uh, infringements up to the European uh, Court of Justice. So we, that, that will go, and I don't think actually it's replaceable, but you know, a, the closest thing that we could get to that is uh, uh, this, this independent body. Lloyd Austin, then Colin Moore. Yeah, I think I would underline the word independent. I think the key thing there is uh, its relationship with government. Um, 
uh, the executive branch, so the Scottish Government and its agencies, etc., uh, not its relationship with Parliament. I think your, your initial question about the role of Parliament, we certainly would completely uh, see unchanged and of, of, of value in itself. Indeed, I think it could be a situation where the independence of the scrutiny body uh, was assured by it being responsible to Parliament in the way that the Information Commissioner and his or her office is a parliamentary um, f function rather than an executive function. Um, I, I completely agree with you also, Kavina, about the need for it to have credibility and expertise. So, uh, you know, resource and um, uh, staffing that enables it to, uh, uh, and sufficient powers to, to seek information of uh, government and its agencies and other players in whatever issue it's investigating is important uh, and so on. So I, I think it... Uh, it, 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 it is, in a sense, it reinforces the powers of parliamentary scrutiny and oversight um, in the way that the Audit Scotland supports the Aud Public Audit Committee or the National Audit Office supports the Public Accounts Committee. That's the sort of uh, reinforcement of parliamentary oversight that this provides an opportunity for rather than uh, a con competitor with parliamentary oversight, if that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Colin Miller and then uh, Richard Lyle has got a question. Yeah, thank you. I'd agree with what was said. Perhaps the two things to be said that argue for something separate from just the parliamentary processes are firstly the potential, the desire to deal with much more specific individual cases than the parliamentary process can normally deal with. And secondly, the very long term nature of environmental objectives and goals that the political process as a whole may be influenced by things that are happening, economic and other things, whereas environmental goals are separate long term. So the degree of independence isolation from short term political toing and froing, which affects all parties, may be significant. Lyle. Yeah, I was a, a Remainer, but you know, we're now leaving the EU and you're now suggesting that uh, the organisations that we are leaving we need to set up in Scotland. I, I just don't get that. Because, number one, it's going to cost. Number two, we've got the Ombudsman, we've got Audit Scotland, we've got High Courts, we've got Standards, the Standards Commission. Why do we need to set up something that we've just left? You're right insofar as the there is a complex of different arrangements that are in place at the moment um, with which we are um, reasonably comfortable and, and accustomed. They do not offer the ultimate, and that, that was the, the sort of formula I was using earlier on, the sort of in extremis uh, uh, model, nor do they potentially allow us to maintain the complex level of knowledge gathering and information exchange that allows a sophisticated modern, modern economy to operate effectively. Um, for example, our environmental standards are substantially different in many areas from those that apply in the US or Australia or other parts of, of the world. Um, and yet the companies and citizenry, but the companies in particular that operate in this country often have to comply with standards that are developed uh, around the world but are substantially dominated, Euro 6, for example, by the standards that have come from within the EU. Being able to shape those standards, being able to learn early what they are, being able to work with them, being able to share expertise and experience both ways with our uh, European market colleagues is, a, is an extraordinarily valuable component of, of running the Scottish economy or operating the Scottish economy. Um, so, the, I suppose in a sense we don't know that which we will lose until we have lost it, so there is a, there is a preventive bit of action there, um, but it's very clear that there are certain areas, as I, I suggested earlier, where we're already being excluded from things that are potentially hugely disadvantageous. And I think the final thing I would say again before colleagues uh, come in would be um, the reassurance of the citizenry and the rights of, of the public to be able to be confident 
about what is and isn't happening is greatly strengthened by having oversight bodies and networks of contact that we have currently through the, the structures of the European Union. Could we survive without them? Well, quite possibly. But would we be healthy is, is the, probably the way I would, I would explore it. But I, I think uh, these, are, these are decisions um, that may already be being made. But I think for us to be a successful, especially a, a successful uh, small progressive nation within the global context, being outside these networks is potentially a source of vulnerability that seems foolhardy, potentially. Okay. Um, I'm conscious of time, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, Johnny Hughes briefly, and then... I'll be very quick. I'll just simply say that when this Parliament passes environmental laws, I assume that you want those environmental laws to be implemented properly. And if there's no mechanism, or, or if there's a deficient mechanism by which you understand how those laws are, are being implemented or not, um, I think that, that would be a worry to the Parliament. Um, and with the loss of the oversight from the European Commission and the ECJ, we will have a deficient mechanism. We will have a gap. We've clearly identified that in the report. Uh, and that's a gap that we think should, should be replaced in some way by a, a, a structure um, in, in Scotland. And did we? No. We might not have had the gap, but we probably didn't have, well, we not probably, delete. We did not have the environmental standards that we now have, which fundamentally underpin the success of, of the Scottish economy and indeed of our society. We are dependent upon clean water or clean air, although there are still issues around that, and our robust waste management and land protection systems. Very few of these were fundamentally embedded in UK or Scottish legislation prior to being a part of the, the, the European process. Uh, uh, and, and as chair of the panel, Professor Gemmell, could you perhaps sum up on this point, because I did ask it at the start. Um, Johnny, you talked about potential gaps. There's a potential gap in terms of setting something like this up, given how close Brexit now is. So, I mean, realistically, it, it strikes me that to determine the role, the scope, the remit, and the resources, get them in place, it would be very challenging to do that. Have you thought about what happens between now and then if your approach was adopted? Um, to, to a, a, a slight degree, we have identified that <clears throat> excuse me, there may need to be interim arrangements, or there could be interim arrangements um, to allow uh, um, the, the position to be, to be rolled forward. And some of that depends upon uh, something we've been uh, discussing at some length, the, the nature of the fit with the UK models uh, at the moment, because clearly the sharing of expertise uh, is, is quite a, a critical part of being able to keep the show on the road, if I use the, the vernacular. Uh, I think um, we, we have not gone into the detail uh, and we, we weren't asked to look at what we would do in the short term to make this, uh, uh, to prepare the foundations of what m might be needed uh, subsequently. I think we'd be very happy to offer um, some analysis and advice of that in, in due course where that asked for. But you're absolutely right, the clock is ticking and there isn't very long to pursue this. But of course the UK has an uncertainty about how long a transition might be and therefore we, we could have the European institutions uh, still for some some considerable time and frankly that could be to, to our advantage but but equally it means that some of the responsibilities that are currently not entirely robust would also need to be pursued during that period so uh, I, I hope people would continue to pay attention okay <laughs> thank you let's move this on to Claudia Beamish right thank you convener um, we've started to explore through the questions from our, our convener about the scrutiny body and we've touched on um, arrangements for courts could we explore that further and uh, look at um, uh, possible arrangements for access to environmental justice um, uh, beyond Brexit? And you've highlighted in your report that uh, um, I think this is one of the at-risk areas. And uh, I, I wonder if you have, um, first of all, broad ideas, and then myself and my colleague Mark Ruskell have got some more detailed questions, depending on whether you answer initially. Um, I suspect um, colleagues here, um, particularly Lloyd, w would have views on uh, the, the access point, uh, and I think in terms of, of, the, of the strict legal, Colin will also be able to, to amplify. Um, I, I suppose just in summary, it's very clear that um, a number of different court-based options could be pursued either through existing courts, some, somehow supplemented, or there could be a, a, a dedicated uh, uh, court. Um, there are such bodies worldwide from which 
I think lessons could be learned. They can, they can also suffer from a number of disadvantages, but they can be very useful parts of the mechanism. For me, it often depends culturally on the environment within which they operate, exactly what compliance currently looks like, for example, is, is often a critical part of it. Uh, could, you, could you, just for the record, give us any... Um positive examples of the functioning of courts um, in other countries? Um, the, well, the, the environment, land and resources courts of uh, Australia, for example, uh, in New South Wales, in Victoria, in uh, South Australia, all deliver versions of, of uh, um, what could be deployable. Uh, and particularly the South Australian model is relatively modest in scale and works relatively effectively. Uh, in New Zealand, there are also um, there's a lot of case law, a lot of practice based on Maori rights and the, the management of land and the environment together. And of course, we have a, a rather a focused, um, dedicated land court within Scotland. And so there, there are starting points from which um, arrangements could be made. Or frankly, it could simply be uh, done, for example, it was proposed in, in my time in, in SIPA, that we have dedicated environmental fiscals, for example, and that we could then build a model towards an environmental court. Now, I know there are divergent opinions about the merits of, of, of the court, but there are, there are options there. But I, I think particularly on the, the, the robust detail, um, uh, Colin and, and Yeah, I think a access I? to justice is one of the key things. Um, our our gov uh, Scottish government, uh, uh, whilst we're part of the EU, uh, uh, wishes to main, uh, has, has to implement European environmental law and does it as in various ways. Um, the Cabinet Secretary has made very uh, welcome commitments to want to maintain those environmental standards, hopefully including the standards of access to justice. Um, at the present time, citizens, communities, NGOs, any concerned person can uh, ask the Commission through the complaint procedure to look into any sort of decision as to whether or not something has uh, a, a decision by any executive body, uh, any national authority has um, complied with the provisions of that EU law and the Commission carries out a uh, first stage, as Campbell was saying earlier, quite a soft inquiry uh, and an investigation, but in extremis, it has the power to refer it to an environmental court. And if we, if we remove ourselves from those institutions, we remove ourselves from that access to uh, oversight and inquiry and, and potentially justice. Um, and as Richard Lyle said we didn't have that before we went in, but then we didn't have political commitments to the Aarhus Convention, for instance, before we went in. So uh, the engagement between citizens, communities, and a government was in a different area, and, uh, and governments now, including the Scottish government, have strong commitments to public participation and access to, go to, to justice, which we would need to reproduce. And I, I think a scrutiny body... Uh, that has the ability to, uh, to, to carry out those kind of inquiries on behalf of communities or citizens and has the power in extremists to refer it to the courts, potentially an environmental court, would be one way of delivering that. Um, Claudia Beamish has got a further question, and I'm going to allow Alex Neal and Donald Cameron and Mark Roscoe some questions. And I know Colin Reid's chomping at the bit to come in, so uh, after Claudia has asked her question, we'll bring Colin Reid in to start. Actually, convener, I, I, I think it would be useful if Mark developed the, the question on our house. Is that as Mark, Mark Truscoe. Yeah, uh, thanks uh, for that. Um, just, just on our house, um, I mean, is it your impression that the Scottish Government is currently compliant with our house? Yeah, exactly. um, uh, and if, if it's not now, then how do we need to develop these structures to ensure that there's compliance with this fundamental access to justice going forward? I think, as you'll note from the, the, the report, that's an area where the, the Scottish Government and some members of the roundtable sub, subgroup were in disagreement. So the, the Scottish Government assert it is in compliance, um, yet um, in our... At the references at the foot of page eight, you'll see that we provide references to the Aarhus Compliance Committee that have found the UK and all the jurisdictions in the UK, including Scotland, not in compliance. Uh, so I'll leave you to 
to reach a judgment on that point. Uh, um, but um, the, the issues relate to uh, costs of review procedures and whether those review procedures can consider the merits of the case. Um, and uh, in both those situations, certainly the NGOs and some other uh, legal practitioners believe uh, that all jurisdictions in the UK, including Scotland, are not in compliance. And that either means uh, the need to revise uh, the rules of court or uh, to um, uh, uh, establish a, a separate sort of entity like an environmental court with, with different procedures. Uh, just on costs, I will note that the uh, Scottish Just Civil Justice Council are looking at costs, and, uh, uh, and uh, although stakeholders have provided comments on their initial proposals, we don't know what the final proposals are. So there may be progress on that point, but we've not yet seen the, 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 the results. So the, 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 the two aspects here, one, one is in relation to cost, the other is in relation to merit based review. Is there, is there any recourse to a merit-based review within the justice system at the moment? Because I, my understanding of judicial reviews is they're much more about the process of how a decision came to be made. But is there any recourse to, to a, a you know, an analysis, uh, a judgment on, on the merit of a decision being made? Because that's quite a political question. And it, with Ms. sustainable Jones, development, obviously, Colin will governments, be are, and for that, governments <laughs> are balancing economic and environmental interests. So, what? How do you? How do you incorporate the, uh, an analysis of the merits of, of a decision into into this justice? If I may, I think that you're absolutely right that the courts are not the place to decide merits. Traditionally, they just regard the legality of a decision. But what we have to bear in mind is that with a lot of the EU law, we are faced with a very different sort of set of duties on government from what we've been used to in the domestic scene. EU law provides, uh, imposes a duty on the government to achieve particular outcomes. Whereas in things like planning the areas where we're used to judicial review, the law provides the process by which decisions must be taken, and so long as a planning authority has taken, has looked at the relevant considerations, and has reached a reasonable decision, it's not for the courts to intervene. That's the, that is monitoring the legality of the decision-making process. When you're looking at many of the obligations under EU law, which will become domestic law, which are imposed on the government, they are to make sure that a particular standard of air quality, standard of water quality is achieved. And in deciding whether or not that law has been met, you inevitably have to start looking more at merits, the substance of decisions, rather than simply the process. So our existing courts, our way of dealing with cases, simply isn't used, isn't accustomed to dealing with these issues about whether or not there has been compliance with a specific stated outcome. Can I broaden this out and have Alec Neil and then Donald Cameron ask questions and we can continue the discussion. Alex Neil. Yeah, can I broaden it out from access to justice, although that's extremely important. Can, can I ask, are we going about this the right way? I, I mean, it seems to me this is an ideal opportunity for Scotland and indeed the UK to assess where it wants to be in terms of environmental standards in the round in 10, 15, 20 years' time, and then work out, given the new arrangements vis-a-vis -vis Brexit, how we best get there under the new arrangements. Now, you mentioned that the EU is very often ahead of the game compared to other jurisdictions, but that's not always the case. I mean, the environmental standards in California, I would suggest, are ahead of the EU in many respects. Uh, some countries have tighter control of nuclear installations than we do in Europe. Um, and, you know, there's a, a, a whole range of things. I mean, this, this, uh, there's a danger that it sounds like a lament for leaving Europe rather than how do we, how do we seize the opportunities that are now before us and how do we make Scotland, as we are in climate change, more broadly, a leading nation in relation to these other things. And bear in mind, if you take climate change, it's not driven by the EU, it's driven by global agreement, not by the EU. 
point. Cause so we tangential point now, and then we'll come to Donald Cameron. Yeah, because I, I think that last point you made um, actually was 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 very important. Because if you look at something like the Convention on, on Biological Diversity or the environmental aspects of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the EU actually uses those and and translates those into into tangible outcome-based targets, as as um, Professor Reed was was referring to. And it's that it's that difference actually between um, loose kind of process commitments and very tangible biological outcomes that we're trying to achieve, which is the difference between kind of si signing up to. I think we are congenitally incapable of doing that for ourselves. No, no, I, 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 I will come back to that. Well, I would hope not, but I come back to the point of if if we are serious about our, our international commitments and our collaboration with with others and our and our commitments to contribute, if you like, to the to the global effort to halt biodiversity loss or tackle climate change. You know, it's really important for us, I think, to align um, where we can with, with some of those commitments that we've made at the international level and, and at the European level. So that sense of cooperation and, and collaboration, I think, is very important. Notwithstanding that, of course, we can go further. Um, and indeed, in the transposition of some of the EU environmental directives, um, particularly things like strategic environmental assessment, water framework directive, we indeed have gone further than other parts of the UK. Um, so that, that is completely within our bailiwick and we can do that. Um, I do think in, in the future, potentially, we could actually look at targets on a domestic, um, UK, an existing UK level, EU level and international level and package those up in a coherent way, um, possibly under a piece of, 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 of legislation. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily mean that you know we went aligned with, uh, uh, and indeed there's a political commitment being made to 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 continue to be aligned with uh, e EU environmental um, targets. The so point we, joining that, certainly, I, I agree with you. A, you know, a, a a a commitment to kind of getting those in one place and and having a coherent framework, I think, would be a very good idea. But, but also convergence is not just within the EU. The, you know, there's a global convergence in a lot of this stuff, just because there has to be, uh, because the environmental control doesn't stop the good quality air doesn't stop when you go into or out with the air space of the EU or the UK or Scotland. You know, it's more and more done on a global basis. Now, you you mentioned Operation, that, yeah, yeah. you mentioned that eighty percent of the environmental legislation going through this place uh, has its derivative from EU legislation. But what percentage of EU legislation is derived from global agreements? I mean, if you take the, so, and we are part of the global community. The UK is part of the global community. Um, My original point, but the point is that that is very soft law. Whereas when it's translated through European directives, it becomes much more outcome focused. But we, much can, we, can, we can do that for ourselves. Come back and forth. Can we answer the questions Aye. and come back? Lloyd Austin has been bursting to come out on this. Yeah, I was going to underline the fact that most EU law comes from international uh, stuff anyway, but I agree with Johnny that at international level, it tends to be softer than EU law. Uh, in a very narrow sense, uh, this report focuses on the governance gaps post-Brexit because that was our remit. That was what we were asked to do. Yeah. But in a, in a wider we... sense, I would say that uh, actually we should do some or all, some, some of the options that this report highlights to address the post-Brexit short-term issues. But I completely agree with you in terms of a long-term vision as well. Uh, and I don't think the two are incompatible. I think we ought to do both. And actually, we very much welcome the First Minister's commitment in the programme for government to publish a long-term environmental strategy. I think that's the phrase that's used. Uh, I, slightly unclear as to when and what it will be, uh, but I think there is a, a, a hint in that that some thought is being given to the kind of long-term uh, approach that you're, you're suggesting. But I think in the short and medium term, particularly in a situation where the government is committed to moving environmental uh, EU law over into domestic law through the continuity bill or the withdrawal bill, and then maintaining standards, we do need to make sure that we've got the, the means to be able to fulfill those commitments, as well as thinking about our long-term strategy. Very useful discussion. Thank you for that, Al Gullet. The very patient Donald Cameron. End. <laughs> no, I'm just actually uh, picking up on that that discussion uh, with Alec Neil. I mean, our house is 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 a prime example of international environmental law, and it seems to me being a member 
of the EU has not given it greater teeth, um, given, given the fact there are questions over whether we are currently complying with it, especially when it comes to access to justice. Um, our house has three pillars, uh, and some aspects of it have been translated into some aspects of EU environmental law, uh, in particular things to do with public participation in relation to emissions consents and so on. Uh, the key pillar, the access to justice pillar, uh, is the one that has not been translated into EU law. And I have to say it was member states that resisted the Commission's proposal for a directive on access to justice in order to make it harder, uh, 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 in order to make it harder law, in other words. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, at an, if we were still in the EU, the NGOs would be pushing for uh, the... That, that pillar of Aarhus to be converted into a directive. But you're right, Aarhus is a Council of Europe convention under the, the UN procedures um, uh, and uh, it's international law. I, um, thank you for that answer, Lloyd. Can I focus in on, on the environmental courts? It's particularly interesting. I should refer to my register of interest as a practicing advocate. Um, it seems to me that the Scottish Land Court um, exists with a judge who has the same status as um, a senator of the, of, of, of the court of session. Uh, it has a system whereby that judge sits with lay members, currently agricultural or crofting specialists, could easily be environmental specialists, and is in effect a, a tailor-made um, solution to this. Um, and I wonder what the panel's observations are on that. And also, could I just ask Professor Gemmell, you spoke about disadvantages, I think was the word you used, about environmental courts. Could I ask you to expand on the disadvantages of, of, of an, an environmental court? Um, I, I think the issue for me is one around the effectiveness of the court model and the way in which it is either um, good value or actually creates a formality to positions that often are, for, again, for me, uh, rather softer in reality, uh, if I try and clarify what I mean. Um, going to law, going to court, is often a, a, a clumsy and ha it has to be a highly specified way of pursuing a particular matter. Um, if, if I put it in personal terms, receiving a phone call from Brussels about potential infraction proceedings somewhere down the line focused the, focused the mind wonderfully, um, rather than the sense of being absolutely at the point of going to court. And so um, I, I, the weaponry that's in place needs very carefully to be considered, but it's not, it should not be the weapon of first choice. We should be designing the whole system to be effective. So I have no particular reservations really about the idea of a modification to the land court. Actually, I, that's why I'm, I refer to it. It's, I think it's a potentially viable model. Whether it's the best model and whether it would deliver the right outcome consequences, behaviourally or for the environment, is less clear. But would you be, just on the question of the phone call from Brussels, would you not be as um, sort of, you know, stimulated into action by a phone call from the new UK or Scottish enforcement agency? Absolutely. Um, I, and I think if we, if we focus, for example, on propriety around uh, the use of investigatory powers, for example, I, I had very similar conversations in my previous role where consideration of, of heading down that path was enough to question and, and revise or at least analyse the situation that, that uh, we find ourselves in. So I think there are a number of options there. I don't think there's a particularly pure right answer. I think we, we rightly should be exploring further possible options. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Expanding on that, I think the importance of the weapon of first choice, the phone call, either from Brussels or, or the UK or Scottish scrutiny body, uh, that phone call is much more effective as a soft measure if the recipient knows that if he or she doesn't take action or look into it and see whether they, et cetera, that the scrutiny body has the power ultimately, like the Commission does, to refer the case to a court. So I think the in extremis uh, at the end of the process, uh, of, of a process, uh, opportunity for an issue to be addressed by a court is an important part of the range of weaponry, so to speak, that's, that's required. Uh, I think if, if we were considering 
what court and how in Scotland that provision might be provided for. I think your suggestion of expanding the land court into a land and environment court is a particularly good one. I think it's an opportunity in Scotland where we already have a relatively informal and merits-based uh, court uh, 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 that exists. And it's quite notable that many of the other similar sort of institutions around the world, as well as the ones that Campbell mentioned, there's one in, in Sweden, there's one in Vermont, uh, there's one in Hawaii, and uh, uh, many of the Canadian provinces as well. They often combine land and environmental matters. So land and uh, agricultural and environmental matters get combined in similar courts. And the importance is, I think, that they have the expertise available, such as the assessors you're talking about, but they equally uh, create a body of jurisprudence that drives future decision-making so that actually uh, standards are maintained and ultimately there's less kind of um, uncertainty. Uh, you may be interested to know that the one in Vermont was established by a very uh, pro-business Republican governor because of complaints about uncertainty and slow decision-making, etc. And by creating a body of uh, case law that created, um, uh, essentially set out the rules on a merits-based approach as to how decisions should be made, it meant that the decisions at first instance by the local authorities and the agencies were much more consistent and much more and much less challengeable ultimately uh, and therefore made uh, these kind of permitting systems that they have there much more efficient and effective in the long term. So, uh, so it was welcomed by both the development industries and the environmentalists. Okay, thank you. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Vina. Uh, could I take us back to um, what's been described this morning as the phone call? Um, we all want to keep everybody out of the courts. What we want is, is a good environment, and we want good, good people enacting what they need to do, in, in, in my view, certainly. Um, so is there a role before we get to any court structure, which has been a valuable conversation, um, is there a role for an environmental ombudsman or commissioner um, in uh, either setting up of the appropriate frameworks with, with, it, with um, appropriate expert advice uh, or indeed in dispute resolution, rather as there is in, you know, before one got to the land court um, as a tenant and a landowner or whatever. Um. If I could start that one, I, I, I think yes, essentially, would be the answer to, to your question. I think, um, for example, uh, in Canada, the, the um, Sustainable Development Commissioner there, not now, but in the past, for about six years, operated a very good model, which was effectively based on seeking alternative dispute resolution models uh, and outcomes, and, and also holding bodies to account by scrutinising publicly available data and sometimes uh, uh, eliciting hitherto non-available non information. Uh, the, a similar sustainability commissioner in the state of Victoria in Australia operates very effectively in that, in that space uh, and just gives time effectively for consideration, independent uh, consideration of issues away from the, the routine because appeal mechanisms can go um, through the, the vertical chain of, a, of an agency and then to the board and, and onward. They, they often are, uh, at least in in, in part defensive, um, inevitably, because the, the organisation to some extent feels under attack. But where there is a very good relationship uh, with the Sustainability Commissioner, for example, in Victoria, she's been very effective in, in unnoting particular cases. So I, I would certainly um, strongly support the sort of ADR model of, of finding solutions. And I think that, that also speaks to the, the, the point that, that uh, Mr Cameron was making, because I, I think... Um, I am concerned about the sort of increasingly litigious nature of some audiences, particularly those who are very well funded and who may have a particularly heavy axe to grind. Uh, and that can be very distorting in terms of the, the burden it places uh, on, on a sort of nominal notion of justice generally, but also on the administrative capability of an organisation. And it could easily have been resolved in many cases by proper, genuinely robust intervention at an earlier point. So it's, it's about proportionality and about efficiency of public, um, public operations. So I, I think the, an intermediary stage 
uh, and I know, you know, in, in law in Scotland, we're, we're, we're very actively exploring and developing and using ADR type, type uh, models. But I, I think suitably expert mezzanine intervention in some of these cases would actually be a very effective way of, of resolving a number of, a number of issues. Mark Pascal. Yeah, I think that neatly brings us on to, to what role you see um, for third parties in terms of dispute resolution and, and enforcement. Um, do you have anything more to, more to add on that? Jeez, by me, you mean citizens and communities, etc. Yeah. 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 So I think, um, I mean, in all of these areas, we, ha we have to understand that the, the, the most fundamental thing is the way in which environmental law is implemented relates to decisions that are made by public bodies, by ministers, their agencies, local authorities, and so on. And those decisions will be uh, related to uh, consent applications, planning applications, um, land management decisions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in, in most cases, there is an applicant and there are a range of concerned stakeholders that may be neighbours, citizens, communities, NGOs, local, local people of one type or another. And uh, the extent to which all of those players can participate in and understand all of the uh, issues and the procedures varies. Uh, but the overall kind of public participation and access to justice uh, objectives of things like the Aarhus Convention is to make a level playing field and to engage people as much as possible. And I think one of the things that we, we would like to see is, is greater rights for those citizens and others to be able to, to participate in and uh, have either appeal rights or review rights, etc. at certain times. Uh, I my, my view is that if there is a court at the end of the, at the, end of the situation, uh, there is a greater chance of that body of case law building up that means that decisions further down the chain become easier and more definitive and often faster and clearer. Um, but in, in that chain, there's a range of options which we talk about, the commissioner, the ombudsman, the scrutiny body, uh, that can help the process and can do mediation involving all parties. Um, exact, I, I, I don't think in that, in, those, in that range of options, I don't think there's any need for all of them. I think we, what we need to pick out is, is what are the few options we need to fill all the gaps, if that makes sense. And a scrutiny body or a commissioner with a staff uh, plus a court uh, it seems to me to be the... Yeah. Colin Rees wanting to come in on that. Yes, it was just to say that, to remember that as well as the situation that Lloyd started with, where there is an application, because the nature of the environmental obligations on the government inherited from EU law are to meet particular outcomes, it may be that the failure is a cumulative one. For example, in bathing water issues, the reason why bathing waters are, fa are, are failing in particular areas is often not down to one particular decision or one failure to act. It's a whole combination of things. And you need a way in which concerned people can raise that, that problem and get it taken seriously by the appropriate people, whether that's through an ombudsman commissioner, the courts, whatever. The challenges that I see uh, being faced by communities around Scotland, it doesn't matter what environmental issue you're looking at, whether it's airports or bathing water quality or planning issues, it's just the access to good quality, uh, understandable information about regulation, about legal rights. Communities often have to become experts, legal experts, over a short period of time in order to engage with uh, a particular dispute, dispute or an enforcement issue. Do, do you see the kind of not just access to information, but capacity building within communities to understand and deal with environmental information as part of this, this new landscape? Because I just see communities putting in thousands and thousands of hours of, of, of time, often on a voluntary basis, just to try and understand and work with the system that we have at the moment. I think that exists whilst we're in the EU as well as when we're out, so I'm not sure that's necessarily a, 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 a within the remit of, of the work of this subgroup. I think it exists currently as a, as a challenge. 
um, and uh, certainly as voluntary bodies working with communities and others, you know, we do spend quite a lot of time trying to get information from public bodies using freedom of information and other rights, but that can be very long-winded and can, can create a confrontational sort of situation rather than a mediation type situation to compare the Campbell's two examples earlier. Um, I think in terms of the access to advice uh, within Scottish Environment Link there's a, a group looking at uh, environmental rights generally and one of the things that we've identified is uh, absence of good advice on legal and technical points to citizens and communities and uh, we are working to towards trying to establish some kind of uh, environmental rights, environmental law centre or something to try and try and provide uh, greater uh, support for people interested in these issues and how they can how they can address them. But I would underline that I think that's an issue of environmental governance that exists currently whilst we're in the EU and it will continue to exist after Brexit when you know, unless we do anything about it, but we should do something about it now anyway. Can I just move this on? Sorry, um, Corey, be the last question on this section. Right, thank you. It's very specifically about whether um, Scottish courts, and we've had a, a, a quite wide discussion on that, should they be able to impose sanctions and remedy in the shape of financial penalties um, on Scottish ministers and public bodies in the event that there is a failure to properly apply environmental law, um, as is currently the case from the EU? of which we know of some live examples, which I won't go into in terms of, of time. Um, and what should the nature and arrangements be for sanctions and remedy, remedies, both as a deterrent and in addressing the problems? We did, we did address that quite directly. And, and I, I suppose, again, uh, taking uh, Johnny's lead, we, we did effectively say that we weren't entirely convinced this was a, a particularly good idea. I think the. Um, the public already may have some difficulty understanding why one public body pays another public body um, for, for its failures, and it doesn't seem necessarily to be the best way of using public funds, when, not least when they're, they're in scarce supply. So um, financial penalties certainly do, again, focus the mind, but is it an efficient way of, of um, delivering uh, a, a satisfactory outcome? Uh, there are, back to the, the existing uh, CGAEU model and, and the fines levied, even where applied on the, a daily basis, the Greek government, uh, for example, f found it extremely difficult to deliver compliance uh, when it was being fined. Uh, it was deeply, deeply embarrassing to them, but they couldn't actually do very much about it for a whole bunch of other reasons. I'm not making the direct comparison, but it, it seems potentially an, a very awkward place to end up uh, when surely there are, there are better outcomes to be secured at an earlier point in the process. So, yes, it could be done. I think there is a, maybe a slightly different argument about um, the uh, individual agencies that might be involved, but I think a similar logic potentially applies. So, certainly, my, my personal view is that I, I don't think it's an attractive uh, uh, approach to take. I would have thought, um, friendly-faced though you are, you are perfectly collectively capable of being really quite scary if it came to holding to account uh, an individual public servant who had catastrophically failed in meeting their duties. Um, and I think that notion of, of public embarrassment or public focus on uh, a particular failure is a, is a, po a potent we weapon. Uh, but before anyone else answers briefly, um, could I just ask um, for, for the whole panel, if, if, if you do or don't agree um, with what the question was about financial sanctions, and having listened to Professor Gemmell, but also, if not, what else? And I mean, yeah. name and shame may be valuable, but, it, you know, we, we can be tough yeah. about what we hear as well as what we, what we do as politicians and, uh, and as public bodies. So it's quite important to uh, try and understand this. I, I do agree with Campbell about the issue of, of, of fines. I think uh, shuffling money from one public body to another, in a sense, actually doesn't solve the problem. And I think, actually, that the issue relates to, I think, the court and, the, the, or, and or the uh, um, scrutiny body does need to have power to impose sanctions. Those sanctions might include recommending that the person or the body be called before this committee for, 
more detailed scrutiny. It may include orders. If, if the investigation has looked at the merits of the case, presumably the investigation may have some ability of, of identifying what needs to be done to remedy the situation uh, and therefore being able to make an order that the body should do A, B or C to implement a remedy. Those kind of orders, I think, are, are, are possible sanctions. You know, and you know, we, we need to, if we look at the client earth air quality case, the court in England ordered the Secretary of State to produce the air quality plan. So they, they effectively they told the um, miscreant public body what they had to do to get it right. And I think that's much more important a sanction than, than moving public money from one body to another. Okay. Just to be clear, Professor Gemmell, you, uh, the, the view you articulated, was that the unanimous view of the group? The, the, there was no significant right. dissent, if I can put it that way, yes. Right. That's fine. So just in the interest of moving on, uh, thank you for that. Uh, John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener. And I want to talk about uh, our capacity here in Scotland, particularly, and timescales in terms of implementation. And we note that um, Brexit-related work in Whitehall um, has uh, attracted the idea that it may require a further 1,200 um, EU exit rules in DEFRA. Uh, and so can we ask you, do, the, do you believe that the Scottish Government and Environment Agencies currently have the capacity in terms of expertise, staff and funding to deliver a smooth Brexit in environmental policy areas here in Scotland? clear about the, the ultimate scope, it's quite hard to know what the resource requirements would be. But I, I think after um, a, a fairly extended period of, of restraint, and in some cases reduction in resourcing, it's quite hard to uh, imagine that an increased capacity will be able to be achieved very easily. And so I think it, it's almost inevitable that an additional resource would be, would be required. I think when it comes to issues around reporting and monitoring, for example, uh, there is already significant capacity around the, the various institutions involved to provide that information. And there are both academic and NGO and other inputs uh, to, to the model. So I, I, I would tend to suggest, whilst it might, it might, it might be abused, uh, we could assume that that model is reasonably robust at this point. When it comes to the oversight component and preparing material, I think there is potentially a significant uh, additional um, resource requirement, but that's obviously for those individual bod bodies to articulate on their, on their own behalf. Everybody happy with that view on behalf of the group? Thank you very much. And do you believe that Scotland currently has the capacity to replicate all the different roles currently played by the EU in relation to environmental law as it stands at the moment, apart from oversight, perhaps? Short answer, like I can know, but uh, Johnny can amplify. Yeah, well, this, uh, we're really coming coming to the to the heart of the kind of UK UK devolved or England England Scotland. Um, split in terms of what sits in a UK framework, what sits in a devolved framework, because there will be resource implications for that. You know, if, if, if a number of environmental topic areas sit within UK frameworks, then you know, potentially access to resources from down south could be used to then implement those frameworks. Um, if we take um, some of those powers back into, in, into Scotland and decide that they need to be delivered at a Scotland framework level, there will be resource implications um, for that. So in the end, I think we'll probably have a combination of the two because it will be, it will be very pragmatic to have certain things operating at a UK level. Clearly, that um, is a politically sensitive issue, and I, and I think that any decision to, to operate a UK framework will need to be a co-decision between the Scottish government and the UK government. But there may be, of course, areas where we want to have um, uh, much tighter control of what happens in Scotland at, at, at Scottish level, and there will be clearly resource implications for that, um, which we, we we did discuss briefly, and you know we don't have the solution to that apart from there's no magic wand to that because the, you know clearly in some in some cases that the resource implications could be significant. Be fair comment to say that the more control that we wish to exercise here in Scotland over our own affairs, the greater the cost will be of so doing. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's. I mean, that's. A, so, if, 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 if I may, is, is that a direct question to the me or to the panel? Carry on. Um, possibly. Um, I I think we have significant control in Scotland over a number of areas at the moment. Most of the environment um, 
portfolio, arguably. Um, so we still, or nonetheless, we still rely upon the sharing of information with our UK colleagues. Um, if we, as I said right at the start, if we were to try to replicate chemicals agency equivalent knowledge at all four nations or all five nations level, I think that would be horrendously messy and, and unnecessary. Of course, it doesn't make it any less desirable or, or, or less um, wise, particularly if Scotland was to be pursuing higher standards than the rest of the UK. Yes. Although, again, some of that information... Um, would either exist through the ECHA at the moment or through uh, academic supplementation or, or whatever. I think those standards, WHO also uh, and FAO, uh, provide information that could be deployed at, at the Scottish level. The question is whether or not you need to have a licensing model and a review model and an assessment model all replicated at the Scottish level. And I, if I could, I would bend that back to, to Alec Neil's point earlier on. I think I, I very strongly agreed with the basic point that being clear about our own ambition would be the fundamental way of tackling that. And at this point, whilst I, we absolutely know where the floor is, because the Cabinet Secretary has said quite clearly that maintaining existing standards is what we're after, where else do we want to go? And I, I think the idea of a strategy or a, or a deeper vision, uh, rather like the Swedes did when they were in pretty full compliance with the European acquis, they decided to articulate their own ambition. And they've gone significantly beyond that in a number of areas. So there, 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 are, there are other ways of, of looking at this, I think. OK, thank you very much. And so what do we need to do to ensure Scotland can develop the capacity and the time and allocate the resources um, available to ensure a seamless transition after Brexit? If there are foreseeable problems at the moment, and we're inviting you to ponder the imponderables, but nonetheless you can see the obstacles. Well, but not very easy question to answer. I, 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 I think um, this is part of it for, for me and I think for, for this group. We, we've found the discussions that we've had ourselves extremely uh, interesting and clarifying. And Colin and we, we've also had uh, a couple of international lawyers as part of our group. And we, we've looked very widely at, at uh, the agenda, rather thinly, but widely. Um, we, we need to talk about it, we need to chew on it, we need to come to um, sort of contingent and interim positions on a variety of things, and we need to test them against ambition. Um, at this point, I think we, we have a number of areas where there is a lack, of, a lack of clarity about what a good answer might be. We have become extremely used to a model that works very well. So what kind of model do we want in future? Um, it, it's something that, that merits even further discussion than, than we've been able to have. But I, I think... Doing anything that changes from where we are potentially requires a, a relocation of a number of the outcomes we currently have and a reconsideration of the resources and processes involved in it. And that's quite fundamental and certainly far too hard to do, I would argue, in the, the, the timescales available, given that we're already in the Brexit shadow, effectively. Um, well, um, thank you, uh, Professor Again, well, but that really didn't tell us, give us an answer. I mean, it said it, it, essentially it's too hard to contemplate um, without being, dis I mean, I'm not being unkind, but um, we're looking for solutions here, not defining the problem again. And I don't mean that, I really don't mean that rudely. Um, forgive me. Can I? I'm sorry. sorry yeah, so uh, I would agree with what Campbell was saying, but I think there are a few things that we could uh, encouraged to be done. I mean, uh, to some extent, uh, our work as a subgroup is complete because we submitted this report f for the Cabinet Secretary to publish, which she's now done. And I think the key thing is that discussions like this need, need to happen to, to narrow down the options that the government may wish to pursue. And then I think the government needs to uh, commission more detailed work on those options that they wish to pursue. So I think uh, getting some uh, uh, further um, impetus from uh, some kind of sense of direction from, from Scottish Government in terms of uh, where they want to, to, to look in more detail at, at which options to implement, that, that would be the next step. The, in terms of that, I think... Uh, Reflecting on what Johnny was just saying, as you will be aware, the Secretary of State uh, at the UK level has issued a consultation paper on principles and governance after, after Brexit related to England and reserved matters. Uh, and we were talking about how we, uh, Scotland and the UK might or might not cooperate in these things. I think some deliberation about how Scotland might interact uh, with the proposals in that consultation 
and particularly um, your com this committee might be interested to know that the Environmental Audit Committee in the House of Commons are doing an inquiry on the proposals in that consultation at the moment and there'll be quite a lot of good evidence going in, into that inquiry. Uh, in particular, the Environmental Audit Committee asked a question about how this should be managed across the UK. We're not, not at a kind of UK imposition type model, but how do the administrations and the jurisdictions with their different responsibilities uh, cooperate more effectively across the UK to, to fill these gaps in, in governance arrangements, uh, maintaining the, level, the, 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 the accountability to the appropriate parliaments, but pooling expertise and resource where appropriate and where useful and, and efficient to the, the participants. Johnny Hughes, briefly. I'll, I'll, I'll try and give you three recommendations. Um, first one, I think we should, we should implement, continue to implement the body of EU legislation and the principles um, as if we're a member of the European Union. I mean, that's, that's a, I think, something that can be done. We've already got the, the, the processes and structures in place. Uh, we should be ready with, with a new scrutiny body um, for, for the time when the transition period ends, and we may need it. Um, to plug the biggest gap that we identified in the report. And then I think in the longer term, um, we may see divergence between the UK position and the Scotland position in terms of keeping up with uh, in, in environmental law in the, in, in the EU. And that's when I think we could maybe bring forward a, um, a piece of um, rationalised um, policy which, which actually brings together the targets at the various different levels that we talked about before. Um, to be a bit more coherent about what our ambitions are as a country, but very much in cooperation with what's happening at EU level um, in, in, in the longer term. Okay, that's, that's a useful summary. And the fourth one would be to seek out those associate memberships and, and equivalent arrangements that allow us to maintain access to networks from which we could otherwise be excluded. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Very briefly, if only Carson. I, I think you've covered most of the points, but just, I just want to, uh, to, to get clarity. You know, other than the the policy of not having uh, any weaker environmental policies in Scotland. Uh, and as, as Alec Neil said, we should be looking to see what we want in 10 and 15 years' time in Scotland. Do you believe the Scottish Government currently are doing enough to, to actually give us a direction of travel of where they would like to see us being? You know, you, you talked about the, the consultation paper that Michael Gove had uh, published. Are the Scottish Government doing enough right now to ensure that the direction of travel and the policies we want to see in the future will fit within the inevitable UK frameworks? Part of the answer to that is about what kind of dialogue is actually going on and the level to which the Scottish Government is being included in the processes that, that are determining where, where we may be going. And that appears to have been relatively uh, light, I'm tempted to say minimal. And so it's quite hard, uh, I would have thought, for Scottish Government, and it's certainly hard for me to know the extent to which um, uh, Scottish perspectives are being fully taken into account. Um, but I think having hit... For the horse, do we not need to, as a country, decide what we want to see in 10 or 15 years' time and take that to Westminster rather than sit back and waiting for Westminster to decide what the framework's going to be and us fitting within it? I, I'm not sure it's an either-or or a cart and horse. I think it's probably a both-and. But I think in, insofar as we've had outcomes identified for, for Scotland and we've got the sort of uh, outline consideration of a strategy, that's a start. But I think there does need to be uh, more in that, in that space. But I, I think it is very difficult when effectively within the European context we've been used to the member states speaking, as it were, on our collective behalf plus the dependencies we have on the extent to which the devolved administra administration views are taken into account by the member state, um, going much beyond that at this point is, is particularly challenging. But I, I, I think be one of the things we identified in the report that might be helpful is actually to look at more systematically all of the things on which we currently report and actually building a rather clearer view of the current state of our environment because actually there are quite surprising gaps in our knowledge of the state of the Scottish environment. And if you do look at, for example, the EEA's uh, reports, quite often the UK is a blank because the UK has refused to provide information which Scotland has frequently held, has offered to the UK and then that's not actually gone forward in the EU context. So th there, are, there are a number of areas in which it would be very helpful to simply work out precisely where we were in order to make any further discussion of ambition that much clearer. So I, I think there are some challenges there. 
Very briefly, Johnny Hughes. So quickly, I mean, I would, I would say that I wouldn't necessarily agree that the UK frameworks are inevitable. You talked about inevitable UK frameworks. I think that is a matter for negotiation between the two governments. And as I say, prob the probable model will be one of pragmatism and a kind of split between the two. I really think this is a question of implementation as much as, as ambition. You know, we have a body of environmental legislation, much of which is not being implemented properly at the moment. So a focus on implementation, which is actually what the European Union um, came to the conclusion on a number of years ago and said, you know, we really need now a, we've got a number of framework directives, we really need to be implementing them properly. So I think if we implement them in Scotland, um, you know, we, we would, that, that should be a focus in the future. I do, where I do agree is on, and, and where we didn't cover this in the report, is agriculture policy, which has a tremendous impact on, on, on the environment. And we really need to start thinking quickly about what our vision for agriculture is in Scotland and, and the nuts and bolts of how then we implement that vision in terms of it going forward with our environmental targets, because we will not hit um, our, our agreed environmental targets unless we get agriculture policy right. So I, d I do agree with you in that in that sense. Again, okay. To be fair on our remit, sorry, just to say that the agriculture area was not included in okay, our remit. Okay, we'll get that on the we record. know that Mr. Ewing has commissioned a, a yeah. variety of pieces of work that are doubtless okay. relevant in that area. Okay, thanks for that clarity. Uh, moving on to an area I think we've already touched on, uh, Donald Cameron. If there's anything yeah. left, um, I just <coughs> you've 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 each touched on this already, and the report touches on it. But do you believe there is a need a need for a UK-wide approach to environmental policy post Brexit? Lloyd Austin. There is a need for the solutions to cover the whole of the UK uh, because all of the geographic area that is in the UK will lose its EU oversight in a, in a sense. That doesn't necessarily, as Johnny said, mean that that has to be uh, always... Uh, everything has to be UK-wide because most of the environmental issues are devolved. Uh, we, we believe there are, there are potential benefits in terms of pooling resources and sharing information and all of those things that apply to the four countries of the UK just the same as they apply to the 28 member states of the EU or bigger um, families of nations in, in Europe as a whole under, under the Council of Europe or the UN. Um, I think uh, inevitably there will be some areas where things would might be best done across the UK in order to maintain uh, commonalities and address cross-border issues. Tweed and Solway are quite uh, an important area of um, cross-border environmental management. We have a cross-border river basin management plan for that area, for instance. Uh, but everything, in a view of the NGOs, we believe that this needs to, all of this kind of joint working needs to be co-designed and co-owned so that the appropriate uh, authorities and the lines of accountability to the appropriate parliaments are maintained. And that does mean dialogue between the governments needs to be improved. Um, as, as outside stakeholders, we find the entire intergovernmental process completely lacking transparency and stakeholder engagement and uh, to, we, we recently supported a piece of work by the Institute of Government in terms of how this intergovernmental working could be improved for the better delivery of environmental um, uh, uh, cooperation amongst other things. In terms of the scrutiny bodies, Obviously, uh, the Secretary of State is proposing one for England and reserve matters. There's proposal here for, for Scotland. Um, Wales and Northern Ireland, obviously, uh, will suffer the same need. How they go forward and how they cooperate, uh, uh, I think it's necessary that there is cooperation, but I think the answer should emerge from a process of co-design uh, in terms of whether or not the, the body is, is one body with four departments reporting to different uh, parliaments or whether it's four bodies that uh, each have a responsibility to cooperate on uh, UK-wide or cross-border issues. Uh, that's kind of not important. The importance is that the whole biogeographic area uh, is, is addressed and that uh, the uh, proper accountabilities are maintained. Uh, and that could be something that the various 
government officials working together ought to be able to co-design. At the moment, it looks as though each of the governments are working in isolation on this. Uh, Colin Reid, I think you want to come in, do you? Yes, yeah, so just to say there's also the aspect of reporting in relation to international obligations. Any reporting there has to be done on a UK basis, so you have to have a way of bringing things together. But as has been said, that doesn't necessarily mean a single UK body. There have just got to be good ways of, of joint working and collaboration. Thank you. Uh, Donald Cameron, do you have any other? No, uh, Johnny Hughes. Can I, can I just add to that? I mean, in, in some ways, the JNCC, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, does that collation of, of uh, environmental data at the, um, from, from the devolts and, and brings that up and does the, that reporting. But I think the answer to the question is no, um, in terms of there is no need to, for, for, for UK frameworks in those areas of, um, of, of devolved responsibility. But it may well be um, the pragmatic and sensible thing to do in some areas, such as chemicals. In fact, I would, I would go further and say it's probably more sensible and pragmatic to operate um, the chemicals regime at the European level and continue to do that. Um, but there may be some areas, for example, where geographically and institutionally it makes more sense for us to have a, a, a fully Scottish approach and a fully devolved framework, such as, um, for example, debatably, um, biodiversity policy. Thank you for that. And to wrap up the session, Richard Lyle. Yes, I've got uh, several questions, but based on your evidence, if we have to have a, an environmental scrutiny agency, my boss always said you had to look at the bigger picture. We also need a transport agency, a fishing agency, a law agency, a land agency, a local government agency, and so on and so on. It's going to cost a fortune, which I would suggest makes a bit of a mockery of Parliament, let's take back control. Um, so once we leave the EU, uh, and the EU has ratified the treaty but the UK has not, uh, then can we ignore it? And in your opinion, what would be lost in terms of environmental best practice if UK public bodies and stakeholders only relied on environmental commitments made by the UK government? I or we are um, really empowered to respond uh, in much detail to the first part of what you said. Um, I, I surmised. Um, I, I think um, it, is, it is clear now to us, having spent some weeks reflecting on this in a small number of meetings, that there is a huge amount of complexity within uh, the existing systems and when we look at what we might lose, we become very focused on those components, some of which were clear before, some of which were not entirely clear before. So um, a process of, of careful examination of the consequences of the decisions that have been taken is potentially quite painful and has been very informative. Uh, in terms of um, the, the second part of, 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 of what you said, um, I think, um, I'm partly reflecting on what Johnny said earlier, we have from 1923, 1946, 1990, 1995, we have gone through a series of large legislative steps which have dramatically changed the nature of environmental governance and environmental policy and environmental practice in Scotland, increasingly devolving those elements from the UK to the Scottish level. Unpicking that, and if we are operating in some UK frameworks going forward that, that take control and take decision-making away from the Scottish level to which it had previously been devolved is potentially uh, damaging in a number of ways in terms of outcomes, as, as Colin was trying to articulate, that signing up to a number of EU directives has meant that we have been much more focused on delivering outcomes rather than merely uh, sp specific pieces of activity during that period. And there is a coherent not always entirely comfortable, but there is a coherent uh, family of, of uh, uh, decision-making and process that has given us the standards of environment protection that we have. Um, again, as colleagues have said, we are still weak in some areas, despite a lot of effort and a lot of investment. Our water environment is amongst the best, if not the best in Europe. Our air quality environment is often not. Uh, and our ability to handle wastes uh, in the circular economy has improved dramatically and is now at the better end of the spectrum. Uh, our ability to manage our land quality is still not entirely uh, robust. So there are a number of areas in which we have made huge progress and we don't know what would have happened. There's no counterfactual. We don't know what would have happened otherwise. Um, but I think we are taking risks 
Our process here, I think, has perhaps helped to articulate the nature of some of those risks and to help focus us all, including uh, the Scottish Government, uh, on how to address those risks and, and how to at least um, contingency plan uh, for, for handling them. But I think we are still, uh, and in a sense it's a rebuttal to, to what John was saying, um, you know, I, I don't think we are in a position to offer a, a, a glib or straightforward solution at this point. I think we are partway through understanding just what we've got ourselves into, and there is a lot more to be done. But I hope that our evidence has been able to articulate some of the challenges there. Other members can, of the panel can come in. Can you, and I'll, I'll try and cut this back, um, what would you say are the print, uh, priorities for future work? What future research and expert input is needed? And can we, one, just adopt EU laws uh, in total, uh, or two, do we start now to amend over, over 40 years of legislation? Response to that, Convener. I mean, I think this, this is rather political. We're, we're, we're getting into quite political territory here, but as I see it in the future, there's been a political commitment in, in, in Scotland from the, from the current government to keep up with um, the implementation and the changes and, the, and track those in the future with, with, with environmental law. Now, that could, that could see a divergence of uh, environmental policy and, and legislation in Scotland in the future from, 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 UK, uh, from, from the UK legislation. Um, and over time, it, that, that divergence actually could be quite stark. It could, um, from, from our perspective, I, mean, I, I think we, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chair, um, but we, we see there's, there's a lot of merit in the outcomes focused, and Colin, Colin Reid mentioned this before, the outcome focused nature of a, a lot of EU legislation as, as, um, as compared to the more process-focused legislation that we see in, in, in domestic legislation. So therefore, that political commitment is a very valuable one. Um, so signing up to keep up, um, to, to use your term signing up, Campbell, um, signing up in the longer term, if you like, to, to track and implement EU legislation and go beyond, if we, if we so wish, in terms of articulating a new vision for, for Scotland's environment, I think would be, would be, our, would, would be our preferred um, uh, uh, option for the future. And I think, uh, in terms of that, my understanding, and, and Colin may want to add to this, is that the intention of either the EU withdrawal bill at Westminster or the continuity bill that this Parliament passed is to bring over all of the existing EU law into domestic law. So I think uh, your number one point has actually is either going to be done or has been done. But that's the starting point. The, 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 the f issue that we've been focusing on, uh, the, there's the longer term environmental ambition question that Alex Neil raised and how we may track or exceed future EU law. But the thing that this report has focused on is the question of what sort of monitoring, measuring and reporting, what uh, scrutiny and implementation and enforcement measures are necessary to make sure that all of that EU law that we brought over in that withdrawal or continuity bill are properly implemented and deliver the outcomes that we be that that they were intended to deliver. So it's about making sure that the good intentions of bringing that law over are delivered. Thank you, and I appreciate your work. And just in I, case you think I don't. <laughs> can I give the final word to Professor Reid, who's been very patient today? I was just thinking that, the, as my colleagues have said, that the short-term political decision has been taken to carry over all the EU law rather than wiping the slate clean and starting again. That then provides an answer on, the, on a certain date. We then need, as my colleagues have said, to make sure it gets implemented. There are then policy decisions to be taken at the political level over whether we continue to track the changes, the adjustments in EU law as it goes forward, or whether we set off in our own direction, whether that's for a higher, a lower standard, deregulation, environmental champions. Those are political decisions for the future, which need to be taken. But there is also the short term issue of just keeping the machinery going with things like chemicals approvals, chemicals recognition, and making sure that what we have today is actually implemented and, and is taken seriously. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Reid. Thank you, all of you, this morning. That's been very informative. I'm going to suspend for five minutes, then we'll resume. Thank you.
that I'll come back. Folks, thank you. Uh, welcome back to this meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The fourth item on the agenda today is to consider the Code of Practice on Litter and Refuse Scotland 2018, uh, SG 2018-81. Uh, um, can I invite any comments on this instrument? Uh, Richard Lyle to be followed by Claudia. Yes, Jamis. convener, I uh, welcome this uh, uh, updated Code and Practice on Litter and Refuse. Uh, I abhor people who throw litter on the street. I encourage people to put it in their bins. I've encouraged my kids and my grandchildren now to ensure that they um, deposit their litter uh, correctly. And I abhor people who throw litter out of their cars, going along motorways or bypasses. And this conveys to councils and focuses, and I'll read it just slightly. Resources were focused to clear up rather than prevent the problem which were at odds with recommend prevention. We now uh, should prevent people from littering, uh, encourage, people from uh, encourage people to deposit their litter in bins and ensure that street cleansing is done meticulously in, in order. When I go to other countries, uh, I see streets that are absolutely clean. When some streets you walk down in Scotland, especially with respect to my... Uh, residents and, and constituents in the central belt require uh, a bit of extra care. So I would encourage everyone to uh, work towards on this new code of practice and litter in, in regards to refuse. Okay. Corey Beamish, followed by Mark Roscoe. Thank you, convener. Um, and I, I particularly welcome this, um, this new approach that's highlighted in um, the first duty, uh, which looks very specifically at behaviour change rather than simply the process of um, collection of, of litter um, and that it shouldn't be dropped in the first place. Uh, I think one of the indicators is something I'd like to highlight, I was very pleased to see is there, is to improve the state of Scotland's marine environment, which um, uh, is, uh, is something that wasn't there before in the, in the previous iteration. So I welcome it and I'm supportive. Thank you. Mark Ruskell. Um, likewise, I, I welcome this. Um, I think it's working at the right end, which is you know prevention first rather than dealing with the consequences. Um, I, I do have a question, it's, and it's about the clarity over um, organisations that may be contributing towards a litter problem, which then the public sector has to has to pick up. Um, if you're a local authority, you manage a park, but it's right next to McDonald's, uh, and there's litter everywhere, and you know there's obviously a duty on the local authority then to ensure that the park is clean and provide appropriate bins. You know, what's the role of the, the other organisation in, in, in the picture that's driving a lot of the production that's waste in the first place um, in terms of making its contribution? So in terms of the polluter pays, um, I think it'd be good to get some further clarity from the government about uh, how it's approaching that side of the equation, because obviously we don't want to be putting undue burden onto public authorities when the problem's actually, you know, being created by a, uh, a, a, another organisation. Seems like a reasonable ask to write to the government, although one might point out there are other, are other fast food outlets next to parks. Um, Finlay Carson. Yeah, just a, a welcome the report. Uh, you know, Keep uh, Scotland Beautiful have done some great work with Dumfries and Gallery Council, taking some quite controversial decisions to move bins and whatever from laybys along the 75 and also working in conjunction with uh, Stena and p and to, to try and address the, the issue. So I, I look forward to some more innovative ideas coming out of this and the councils working with these organisations to, to try some different things to change uh, people's behaviour when it comes to litter. Okay, uh, John Scott. Um, thank you, convener. And just as someone who pricks up litter both in Ayrshire and uh, Edinburgh, can I encourage Edinburgh Council to empty their bins on a more regular basis because much of the problems in the Edinburgh area comes from bins that are overflowing um, and are not emptied timiously. I'm sure Edinburgh Council will take note of your comments. What? I too would very much welcome this, but I do wonder if perhaps as a committee we might want to put a marker down that we might want to take a look at the progress on this issue, perhaps a year or 18 months from now, once this has been in place, to see if it is making a real difference? 
enforcement because, I, I mean, Mark alluded to it, and by enforcement, I don't mean the local authorities should pick up the tab for everyone else's um, litter problem, but um, I do think perhaps we need to look at additional powers, for example, in dealing with uh, fast food restaurants uh, who don't make any effort and others who don't make any effort to ensure that there are bins and all the rest of it round about them, because clearly I don't see why the council taxpayers should have to fork out for uh, wealthy uh, fast food chains uh, who are not doing anything to help the problem. Although, to be fair, I think some are quite active and some are in that area. So, so to summarise, uh, I take it we don't wish to make... Any, oh, sorry, uh, Donald Cameron, you want to make a point? Just, to, form just to formally convene a um, support what others have said about this and also your um, uh, statement about revisiting it in a, a okay. year and a half's time. OK, thanks very much. Um, so I take it then we don't want to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument, but to seek some information along the lines that uh, Mr Roscoe has sought and to note that we as a committee may well wish to return to this issue in a year to 18 months' time to see what progress is being made. OK, thank you for that. Uh, the fifth item on the agenda is petition 1646. Um, this is a petition from Caroline Hayes on drinking water supplies in Scotland. The petition, as members will recall, is calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to, one, review the role of the drinking water quality regulator, and two, commission independent research into the safety of chloramination of drinking water. This was referred previously to the committee, following scrutiny by the Public Petitions Committee, which had taken evidence on it from stakeholders. I think paper five that you have outlines the previous scrutiny of the Petitions Committee and suggests some possible options available to this committee. Members uh, may, of course, wish to suggest alternative actions in relation to the petition. And again, I invite comments. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. I, th I think we require some additional information before we're uh, in a position to consider uh, coming to a conclusion on this petition, uh, in particular uh, from uh, Scottish Water, and uh, looking at uh, the two things that Scottish Water do uh, to provide portable uh, water to uh, customers, uh, one of which the removing of physical debris uh, in the, the raw water input and the other uh, in looking at removing bacterial load uh, that might be uh, harmful to human, human health. Um, and equally, uh, I think we should be interested in what the drinking water quality regulator does uh, to enforce uh, uh, good decision-making in Scottish water. I don't think there's uh, any particular merit that I've been able to identify in uh, looking at the role of the drinking water quality regulator, um, something I've, my experience, found uh, discharges the responsibilities uh, very well. Thanks, convener. Um, I was interested to read uh, from the petitioner that uh, there's a different approach to the use of chloramination and, and other um, solutions in, in other countries around the world. And I think it would be worth us examining that in more detail. And I think alongside that, what the decision-making process is within Scottish Water about the use of chloramination uh, as, a, as a particular tool. I mean, like Stuart Stevenson, I, I, I don't see a strong case for reviewing the role of the drinking water quality regulator at this point. I think that's established in, 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 in the correct way uh, that it has been. But there is still an issue around the use of this particular technique and how we're benchmarking uh, against other countries in, in the use or indeed overuse of it. We agree with that point. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, uh, my colleague Alex Rowley isn't able to attend for personal reasons today, but he has asked me to highlight that some of his constituents have approached him on, on this very specific issue. And um, they say that research has identified, if I may just read it um, briefly, that ammonia is a neurotoxin and is possibly a factor in Alzheimer's and that chlorine has been identified as a bad halogen, which is known to displace iodine in the body and leads to thyroid disease. And mixing of the two, um, the constituents say, not only kills fish, but presents itself as a toxic byproduct. So this is, this is a serious concern. And there are other countries, um, the constituents have pointed out, um, that do not um, use, um, if I can say it, chloramid chloramidation. 
um, in France or in Germany, and I understand that is for health um, risk reasons. So I think it would be useful if we could, um, uh, on the suggestion of Alec Rowley, look at the um, health aspects, um, even if that's in a limited way that could be identified. Uh, Alex Neil and Richard Lyle. Can I make two points? I, I, I mean, I agree with Alec. I think it's useful to look into this, but the petition calls for us to urge the Scottish Government to look into it. And to, be of, to, to be honest, I think it's more appropriate for the Scottish Government to look into it rather than the Parliamentary Committee, because we don't have the resources at hand to commission the necessary scientific advice and all the rest of it. And just to take evidence from Scottish Water in this, I don't think gives you... Um, you know, uh, enough of a range of I, uh, positions uh, from just one body, which is the supplier at the end of the day. So I would be inclined to accept that part of the petition that we urge the Scottish Government to commission the research into this, uh, rather than us doing the research, because I think they're much better qualified than we are. The second point is, and I would agree with what's been said by Stuart and uh, uh, Mark and others, I don't see a case for looking into the role of the drinking water regulator. Uh, there is an issue about regulation of the water industry, including drinking water, and they have a number of regulators. Uh, local authorities have a role in providing drinking water in certain circumstances, as well as the water industry. Uh, there's also the Water Commission um, for Scotland, which is a regulator and touches on all aspects of Scottish water. The Scottish water itself. SEPA has a role in certain circumstances. So to, to isolate out the drinks water regulator and only look at uh, the role of that regulator, I think would not be doing the job properly. If you were going to review these matters, I think you would need to take a much more comprehensive across the board look at how we can improve, if we need to, the regulation of the water industry in Scotland. So I'd, I would be inclined not to support, I don't see an urgent need for that, quite frankly, I'd be inclined not to support that part of the petition, but to support the part that asks for research into uh, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> that, that may, of course, be a conclusion we come to, having taken further uh, evidence and gathered further information. Uh, Richard Lyle. Yeah, can I uh, agree with my colleague Alec Neil in regards to the item two? I was going to ask, you know, who would commission an independent research into chloramination? Uh, basically, uh, and I think his proposal or his suggestion that we refer it to the Scottish Government, because at the end of the day, any, any uh, investigation would take at least three, six months, possibly even a year. Um, so... Uh, we can't leave the, the petition open, so I would agree that the second item be referred to the Scottish Government for their deliberation. Finlay Carson. I, th I think if, if this is referred to the Scottish Government, I think uh, we need to look at uh, how we can compare the different uh, methods of disinfection that are available uh, so that we're not making decisions based purely on financial concerns uh, and more on uh, you know, health concerns. I think there's a consensus here in getting further information and then perhaps coming, in, at least in part, to the conclusion that Mr Neil has uh, suggested. So in terms of, of if, if, if I am reading that correctly, we, perhaps from the regulator, want to develop an un a better understanding of the options um, and in why, in their view, this particular course of action has been pursued when it appears that there's other countries that choose to take other courses of action. Um, do we wish to seek from Scottish Water further information uh, as to the rationale behind this particular course? Was it driven by financial considerations? Why were the other options discounted? Does that seem a reasonable approach? Yeah. I'd still like to see something. I completely take um, Alex Neil's point about um, capacity and the Scottish Government uh, rather than ourselves, but I would like to as to be highlighting the health concerns, if only from the perspective of raised from constituents. So, a body of evidence available both at a national and an international level on this technology. Uh, and I suspect if we wrote to the Scottish Government, they, we could readily access that and give us a kind of summary of what the evidence is. So, as a way forward, we keep the petition open but we perhaps extend an, invita an invitation to the relevant regulator to, to come before the committee post-recess to answer any of the concerns that we have, that we seek further information as outlined from Scottish Water, 
and we write to the Scottish Government seeking the information as it's been suggested. Is that, um, sorry, Mark Roscoe. If as part of that convener, we could also do our own research into what the international examples are. I mean, I, I would imagine that uh, you know the policy of the water regulator of France or, or wherever is you know uh, information is fairly readily available, and we can understand what the basis of their policy decision is. And if it's a health um, you know related basis, then you know we can understand that in, in more detail without having to do the primary research on it. Okay, thank you. John Scott. Well, I wouldn't disagree with Alec Neil in that we should ultimately pass this um, to the Scottish Government. I think in terms of conducting our own research as a committee of the Parliament rather than asking the, the Government to provide information, I think we should ask SPICE to provide information uh, which we then present to the Government, um, subsequently differentiating the role of Government and, and Parliament. Um, I think that might just be more reasonable in this regard and and, and less conflicted. Okay, so then to summarise, we keep the petition. We agree to keep the petition open. We seek further information uh, through Spice on the alternative methods. We seek any further information we feel appropriate from Scottish Water, and we seek to invite the drinking water quality regulator to appear before the committee post recess as relevant. Is that? Is that agreed? As long as we get the word international. International. So yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So we agree on it. We agree on that. No, thank you. It's always good to get that clear. Thank you for that. Okay, so at its next meeting on the nineteenth of June. Is that the nineteenth of June? No, it's not. Yes, yes. Is it right, okay. No, it'll be the twelfth of June. No. Or oh, is that in private? Sorry, my apologies. The meeting on the 12th of June is separate. On its next, at its next meeting on the 19th of June, the committee expects to take oral evidence on stage one of the Climate Change Emissions Reductions Target Scotland Bill from the Scottish Government uh, Bill team and will also hear oral evidence from Scottish Government officials and SNH on biodiversity targets. The committee will further consider the Environmental Protection Microbeads Scotland Regulations 2018. As agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be vacated as the public part of the meeting is now closed.